Chapter Fifteen of the Wonderful Adventures of Fra the Phoenician by Edwin Lester Arnold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A volume might well be written on what I must compress into this chapter. On the narrow canvas of these few pages must be outlined the crowded incidents of that noble fight above Crecy, whereof your historians know but half the truth, and these same lines, charged with the note of victory full of the joyful exultation of the melee and dear delight of hard-fought combat these lines must too record my own illimitable grief if while i write you should hear through my poor words aught of the loud sound of conflict if you catch aught of the meeting of two great hosts led on by kingly captains if the proud neighing of the war-steeds meet you through these heavy lines and you discern aught of the thunder of charging squadrons aught of the singing wind that plays above a sea of waving plumes as the chivalry of two great nations rush like meeting waves upon each other so shall you hear amid all that joyful tumult one other sound one piercing shriek wherefrom not endless scores of seasons have cleared my ears listen then to the humming bowstrings on the crazy slopes to the stinging hiss of the black rain of english arrows that kept those heights inviolable to the rattle of unnumbered spears breaking like dry november reeds under the wild hog's charging feet as rank behind rank of english gentlemen rush on the foe listen i say with me to the thunderous roar of france's baffled host wrecked by its own mightiness on the sharp edge of english valour listen to the wild scream of hireling fear as dorius crossbowmen see the english pikes sweep down upon them listen to the thunder of proud alencon sweeping round our lines with every glittering peer of france behind him himself in gemmy armour a delusive star of victory riding revengeful on the foremost crest of that wide sparkling tide hear if you can all this and where my powers fail lend me the help of your bold english fancy it was a hard-fought day indeed hotly pursued by the french king numbering ourselves scarce thirty thousand men while those behind us were four times as many we had fallen back down the green banks of the somme seeking in vain for a ford by which we might pass to the farther shore on this morning of which i write so near was philip and his vast array that our rearguard as we retreated towards the north saw the sheen of the spear-tops and the colour on whole fields of banners scarce a mile behind us and every soldier knew that unless we would fight at disadvantage with the river at our backs we must cross it before the sun was above our heads swiftly our prickers scoured up and down the banks and many a strong yeoman waded out only to find the hostile water broad and deep and thus all that morning with the blare of philip's trumpets in our ears we hunted about for a passage and could not find it the while the great glittering host came closing up upon us like a mighty crescent storm-cloud a vast sombre shadow limbed and edged with golden gleams at noon we halted in a hollow and the king's dark face was as stern as stern could be and first he turned and scowled like a lion at bay upon the oncoming frenchman and then upon the broad tidal flood that shut us in that trap even the young prince at his right side scarce knew what to say while the clustering nobles stroked their beards and frowned and looked now upon the king and now upon the water the archers sat in idle groups down by the willows and the scouts stood idle on the hills truth twas a pause such as no soldier likes but when it was at the worst in came two men-at-arms dragging along a reluctant peasant between them they hauled him to the sovereign and then it was please your mightiness but this fellow knows a ford and for a handful of silver says he'll tell it a handful of silver laughed the joyful king god let him show us a place where we can cross and we will smother him with silver oh on good fellow the ford the ford and come to us to-morrow morning and you shall find him who has been friend to england may laugh henceforth at sulky fortune away we went down the sunburnt grassy slopes and ere the sun had gone a hand-breadth to the west of his meridian a little hamlet came in sight upon the farther shore 
and behind it a mile pleasant ridges trending up to woods and trees down by the hamlet the river ran loose and wide and the ebbing stream for it was near the sea had just then laid bare the new wet shingly flats and as we looked upon them with a shout that went from line to line we recognised deliverance so swift had been our coming that when the first dancing english plumes shone on the august hill-tops the women were still out washing clothes upon the stones and when the english bowmen all in king edward's livery came brushing through the copses the kine were standing knee-deep about the shallows and the little urchins with noise and frolic were bathing in the stream that presently ran deep and red with blood and small maids were weaving chaplets among those meadows where kings and princes soon lay dying and tumbling in their play about the sunny meads little wotting of the crop their fields would bear by evening or the stern harvest to be reaped from them before the moon got up we crossed but an army does not cross like one and before our rearward troops were over the french vanguard was on the hill-tops we had just quitted while the tide was flowing in strong again from the outer sea now god be praised for this said king edward as he sat his charger and saw the strong salt water come gushing in as the last man toiled through the kind heavens smile upon our arms see they have given us a breathing space you good sir andrew kirkaby who live by pleasant sherwood with a thousand archers stand here among the willow bushes and keep the ford for those few minutes that it will remain then while philip watches the gentle sea fill up this famous channel and waits as he must wait upon his opportunity we will inland and on yonder hill by the grace of god and sweet saint george we will lay a supper-place for him and his so spoke the bold king and turned his war-horse and with all his troops seeming wondrous few by comparison of the dusky swarms gathering behind us rode north four hundred yards from Cressy. he pitched upon a gentle ridge sloping down to a little brook while at top was woody cover for the baggage train and near by on the right a corn mill on a swell twas from that granary floor sitting stern and watchful his sword upon his knees his impatient charger armed and ready at the door below that the king sat and watched the long battle meanwhile we strengthened the slopes we dug a trench along the front and sides and with the glitter of the close foeman's steel in our eyes lopped the crazy thickets and working in silence while the frenchman's song and laughter came to us on the breeze set the palisades and bound them close as a strong fence against charging squadrons and piled our spears where they were handy and put out the archers arrows in goodly heaps jove we worked as though each man's life depended on it the prince among us sweating at spade and axe and then it was near four o'clock on that august afternoon a hush fell upon both hosts and we lay about and only spoke in whispers and you could hear the kine lowing in the valley a mile beyond and the lapwing calling from the new-shorn stubble and the wimbrels on the hill-tops and the river fast emptying once again now prattling to the distant sea it was a strange pause a sullen heavy silence no longer than a score of minutes and then all in a second a little page in the yellow fern in front of me leapt to his feet and screaming in shrill treble that scared the feeding linnets from the brambles tossed his velvet cap upon the wind and cried they come they come st george st george for merry england and up we all sprang to our feet and while the proud shout of defiance ran thundering from end to end of our triple lines a wondrous sight unfolded before us the vast array of france stretching far to right and left and far behind was loosed from its roots and coming on down the slope a mighty frowning avalanche upon us a flowing angry sea wave behind wave of chief and mercenary countless lines of spear and bowmen and endless ranks of men-at-arms behind an overwhelming flood that hid the country as it marched shot with the lurid gleam of light upon its billows and crested with the fluttering of endless flags that crowned each of those long lines of cheering foemen that tawny ridge there in front of furlong deep 
and driven on by the host behind like the yellow running spume upon the lip of a flowing tide was genoese crossbowmen selling their mean carcasses to manure the good picardy soil for hireling pay far on the left rode the grim doria laughing to see the little band set out to meet his serried vassals and on the right grimaldi's olive face scowled hatred and malice at the hill where the english lay there behind these tawny mercenaries in endless waves of steel d'alencon rode waving his princely baton and marshalled as he came rank upon rank of glittering chivalry a fuming foamy sea of spears and helmets that flashed and glittered in the sun and tossed and chafed impatient of ignoble hesitance and flowed in stately pride towards us the white foam streaks of twenty thousand plumed horsemen showing like breakers on a shallow sea as that great force to the blare of trumpet swept down and as though all these were not enough to smother our desperate valour even with the shadow of their numbers behind the french chivalry again advanced a winding forest of spearmen stooping to the lie of the ground and now rising and now falling like water reeds when the west wind plays among them under that innumerable host that stretched in dust and turmoil two long miles back to where the grey spires of abbeville were misty on the sky the rasp of countless feet sounded in the still air like the rain falling on a leafy forest never did such a horde set out before to crush a desperate band of raiders and that all the warlike show might not lack its head and consummation between their rearguard ranks came philip the vassal monarch who held the mighty fiefs that edward coveted lord how he and his did shine and glint in the sunshine how their flags did flutter and their heralds blow as the resplendent group a deep strong ring of peers and princes curveting in the flickering shade of a score of mighty blazons came over the hill crest and rode out to the foremost line of battle and took places there to see the english lion flayed with a mighty shout a portentous roar from rear to front which thundered along their van and died away among the host behind the french heralded the entry of their king upon the field and with one fatal accord the whole vast baying pack broke loose from order and restraint and came at us we stood aghast to see them fools madmen they swept down to the river a hundred thousand horse and footmen bent on one narrow passage and rushed in every chief and captain scrambling with his neighbour to be first troops squadrons ranks all lost in one seething crowd disordered unwarlike and thus quivering and chaotic heaving with the stress of its own vast bulk under a hundred jealous leaders the great army rushed upon us while they struggled thus out galloped king edward to our front bareheaded his jewelled warden staff held in his mailed fist and riding down our ranks and checking the wanton fire of that grey charger which curveted and proudly bent his glossy neck in answer to our cheering proud calm-eyed and happy king edward spoke my dear comrades and lieges linked with me in this adventure you my gallant english peers whose shiny bucklers are the bright bullocks of our throne whose bold spirits and matchless constancy have made this just quarrel possible oh well i know i need not urge you to that valour which is your native breath right well i know how true your hearts do beat under their steely panoply and there is false philip watching you and here am i yonder behind us the grey sea lies and if we fall or fail it will be no broader for them than tis for us stand firm to-day then dear friends and cousins remember every blow that struck is struck for england every foot you give of this fair hillside presages the giving of an ell of england remember philip's hungry hordes like ragged lurchers in the slip are lean with waiting for your patrimonies remember all this and stand as strong to-day for me as i and mine shall stand for you and you my trusty english yeoman said the soldier king you whose strong limbs were grown in pleasant england oh show me here the metal of those same pastures 
god when i do turn from yonder hireling sea of shiny steel and mark how square your sturdy valour stands on to it how your clear english eyes do look on faltering into that yeasty flood of treachery why i would not one single braggart yonder the less for you to lop and drive i would not have that broad butt that philip sets for us to shoot at the narrower by one single coward tunic yonder i say ride the lank lusty frenchman who thirst to reeve your acres and farther to-morrow if so they may your waiting wives and children to it then dear comrades upon them for king edward and for fair england's honour strike home upon these braggart bullies who would air the lion's den even while the lion lives strike for st george and england and may the sweet god who gives the fortunes of each day judge now tween them and us as the king finished five thousand english archers went forward in a long grey line and getting into shot of the first ranks of the enemy drew out their long bows from their cowhide cases and set the bow feet to the ground and bent and strung them and then it would have done you good to see the glint of the sunshine on the hail of arrows that swept the hillside and plunged into those seething ranks below the close-massed foemen writhed and winced under that remorseless storm the genoese in front halted and slung their crossbows and fired whole sheaves of bolts upon us that fell as stingless as reed javelins on a village green for a passing rainstorm had wet their bowstrings and the slack sinews scarce sent a bolt inside our fences while every shaft we sped plunged deep and fatal loud laughed the english archers at this and plied their biting flights of arrows with fierce energy and all in wild confusion the mercenaries yelled and screamed and pulled their ineffectual weapons and stern shut off from advance by the flying rain of good grey shafts and crushed from behind by the crowding throng tossed in wild confusion and broke and fled then did i see a sight to spoil a soldier's dreams as the coward bowmen fell back the men-at-arms behind them wroth to be so long shut off the foe and pressed in turn by the troops in the rear fell upon them and there under our eyes we saw the first rank of philip's splendid host at war with the second we saw the billmen of fair basquerade and bruneval lop down the olive mercenaries from roquemore and the cities of the midland sea we saw the savage genoese falcons rip open the gay livery of lyon and bayon and all the while our shafts rained thick and fast among them and men fell dead by scores in that hideous turmoil and none could tell whether twas friends or foes that slew them a wonderful day indeed but hard was the fighting ere it was done my poor pen fails before all the crowded incident that comes before me all the splendid episodes of a stirring combat all the glitter and joy and misery the proud exultation of that august morning and the black chagrin of its evening truth but you must take as said a hundred times as much as i can tell you and line continually my bare suggestions with your generous understanding well though our archers stood the first brunt the day was not left all to them soon the french footmen thirsting for vengeance had overridden and trampled down their genoese allies and came at us up the slope driving back our skirmishers as the white squall drives the wheeling sea-mews before it and surged against our palisades and came tossing and glinting down upon our halberdiers the loud english cheer echoed the wild yelling of the southerners bill and pike and sword and mace and dagger sent up a thunderous roar all down our front while overhead the pennons gleamed in the dusty sunlight and the carrion crows wheeled and laughed with hungry pleasure above that surging line gods twas a good shock and the crimson blood went smoking down to the rivulets and the savage scream of battle went up into the sky as that long front of ours locked fast in the burnished arms of france heaved and strove and bent now this way and now that like some strong well-matched wrestlers a good shock indeed a wild tremendous scene of confusion there on the long grass of that autumn hill 
with the dark woods behind on the ridge and down in front the babbling river and the smoking houses of the ruined village so vast was the extent of philip's array that at times we saw it extend far to right and left of us and so deep was it that we who battled amid the thunder of its front could hear a mile back to their rear the angry hum of rage and disappointment as the chaotic troops in the bitterness of the spreading confusion struggled blindly to come at us their very number was our salvation that half of the great army which had safely crossed the stream lay along outside our palisades like some splendid writhing helpless monster and the long swell of their dead-locked masses the long writhe of their fatal confusion you could see heaving that glittering tide like the golden pulse of a summer sea pent in a crescent shore and we were that shore along our front the stout unblenching english yeomen stood to it the white english tunic was breast to breast with the leathern kirtles of genoa and turin before the frightful bows of those stalwart pikemen the yellow mail of the gay troopers of chateauroux and besancon crackled like the dry december leaves the rugged boarskins on the wild shoulders of vosges peasants were less protection against their fiery thrust than a thickness of ladies lawn down they lopped them one and all those strong good english hedgemen till our bloody fosse was full full of olive mercenaries from tarascon and arles full of writhing bisque and hideous screaming genoese and still we slew them shoulder to shoulder foot to foot and still they swarmed against us while we piled knight and vassal serf and master princeling and slave all into that ditch in front the fair young boy and grey-bearded sire the freeman and the serf the living and the dead all went down together till a broad rampart stretched along our swinging shouting front and the glittering might of france surged up to that human dam and broke upon it like the futile waves and went to pieces and fell back under the curling yellow storm-cloud of mid-battle meanwhile on right and left the day was fiercely fought far upon the one hand the wild irish kerns were repelling all the efforts of beaupreau's light footmen and pulling down the gay horsemen of fair bourges by the distant loire three times those squadrons were all among them and three times the wild red suns of shannon and the dim atlantic hills fell on them like the wolves of their own rugged glens and hamstrung the sleek southern chargers and lopped the fallen riders and repelled each desperate foray making war doubly hideous with their clamour and the bloody scenes of butchery that befell among their prisoners after each onset and on the other crescent of our battle my dear tuneful licentious welshmen were out upon the slope driving off with their native ardour one and all that came against them and worked up to a fine fury by their chanting minstrels whose shrill piping came ever and anon upon the wind they pressed the southerners hard and again and again drove them down the hill a good a gallant crew that i have ever liked with half a dozen vices and a score of virtues i had charged by them one time in the day and cantering back with my troop behind their ranks i saw a young welsh chieftain on a rock beside himself with valour and battle he was leaping and shouting as none but a welshman could or would and beating his sword upon his round cumric shield the while he yelled to his fighting vassals below a fierce old british battle song oh it was very strange for me pent in that shining plantagenet mail to listen to those wild hot words of scorn and hatred i who had heard those words so often when the ancestors of that chanting boy were not begotten i who had heard those fiery verses sung in the red confusion of forgotten wars i could not help pulling rein a moment as that song of exultation full of words and phrases none but i could fully understand swelled up through the eddying war-dust over the welshman's reeling line i so strong and young i who yet was more ancient than the singer's vaguest traditions i stopped a moment and listened to him full of remembrance and sad wonder while the paean dirge of victory and death swelled to the sky over the clamour of the combat and then as a mavis drops into the covert when his morning song is done the welshman finished 
and mad with the wine of battle leapt straight into the tossing sea below and was engulfed and swallowed up like a white spume flake on the bosom of a wave for three long hours the battle raged from east to west and men fought foot to foot and hand to hand and twas stab and hack and thrust and the pounding of ownerless horses and the wail of dying men and the husky cries of captains and the interminable clash of steel on steel so that no man could see all the fight at once save the good king alone who sat back there at his vantage point it was all this i say and then about seven in the afternoon when the sun was near his setting it seemed all in a second as though the whole west were in a glow and there was lord alenson sweeping down upon our right with the splendid array of philip's chivalry their pennons a-dance above and their endless ranks of spears in serried ranks below there was no time to think it seemed a wild shout of fear and wonder went up from all the english host our reserves were turned to meet the new danger their archers poured their grey goose shafts upon the thundering squadrons princes and peers and knights were littered on the road that brilliant host was treading and then they were among the english yeomen with a frightful crash of flesh and blood and horse and steel that drowned all other sound of battle with its cruel import jove what strong stuff the english valour is those good saxon countrymen sure in the confidence of our great brotherhood kept their line under that hideous shock as though each fought for a crown and shoulder to shoulder and hand to hand an impenetrable living wall derided the terrors of the golden torrent that burst upon them happy king to yield such stuff thrice happy country that can rear it in vain wave upon wave burst upon those hardly islanders in vain the stern voice of alenon sent rank after rank of proud lords and courtly gallants upon those rugged english husbandmen they would not move and when they would not the frenchman hesitated twas our moment i had my leave just then new from the king and did not need it twice i saw the great front of french cavalry heaving slow upon our hither face galled by the arrow rain that never ceased and irresolute whether to come on once again or go back and i turned to the cohort of my dear veterans i do not know what i said the voice came thick and husky in my throat i could but wave my iron mace above my head and point to the frenchman and then all those good grey spears went down as though to a one hand that lowered them and all the chargers moved at once i led them round the english front and there clapping spurs to our ready coursers flanks five hundred of us knit close together with one heart beating one measure shot out into array and sweeping across the slope charged boldly ten thousand frenchmen we raced across the crecy slope drinking the fierce wine of expectant conflict with every breath our straining chargers thundering in tumultuous rhythm over the short space between and in another minute we broke upon the foemen bravely they met us they turned where we were two hundred paces distant and advancing their silken fleur de lis and pricking up their chargers weary with pursuit and battle they came at us as you will see a rock thwarted wave run angry back to meet another strong incoming surge and as those two waves meet and toss and leap together and dash their strength into each other the while the white spume flies away behind them and with thunderous arrogance the stronger bursts through the other and goes streaming on triumphant through all the white boil and litter of the fight so fell we on those princelings twas just a blinding crash the coming together of two great walls of steel i felt i was being lifted like a dry leaf on the summit of that tremendous conjunction and i could but ply my mace blindly on those glittering casks that shone all around me and i now remember cracked under its meteor sweep like ripe nuts under an urchin's hammer so dense were the first moments of that shock of chivalry that e'en our horses fought i saw my own charger rip open the glossy neck of another that bore a frenchman and near by though i thought naught of it then a great black flemish stallion mad with battle 
had a wounded soldier in his teeth and was worrying and shaking him as a lurcher worries a screaming leveret so dense was the throng we scarce could ply our weapons and one dead knight fell right athwart my saddle-bow and a flying hand lopped by some mighty blow still grasping the hilt of a broken blade struck me on the helm the warm red blood spurting from a headless trunk half blinded me and all the time overhead the french lilies kept stooping at the english lion and now one went down and then the other and the roar of the host went up into the sky and the dust and the turmoil the savage uproar the unheard unpitied shriek of misery and the cruel exultation of the victor and then how soon i know not we were travelling ah by the great god of battles we were moving and forward the mottled ground was slipping by us and the french were giving i rose in my stirrups and hoarse as any raven that ever dipped a black wing in the crimson pools of battle shouted to my veterans it did not need i had fought least well of any in that grim company and now with one accord we pushed the foemen hard we saw the great roan flanders jennets slide back upon their haunches and slip and plunge in the purple quagmire we had made and then each like a good ship well freighted lurch and go down and we stamped beribboned horse and jewelled rider alike into the red frothy marsh under our hoofs and the fleur-de-lis sank and the silver row of mayenne proud monterose azure falcon and the white crescent of donzenac went down and bernay's yellow corn sheaf and Saarburg's golden blazon with many another gaudy pennon and then somehow the foemen broke and dissolved before our heavy foam-streaked chargers and as we gasped the hot breath through our close helmet bars there came a clear space before us with flying horsemen scouring off on every hand the day was well nigh won and i could see that far to left the english yeomen were driving the scattered clouds of philip's footmen pell-mell down the hill and then we went again after his horsemen who were gathering sullenly upon the lower slopes over the grass we scoured like a brown whirlwind and in a minute were all among the french lordlings and down they went horse and foot riders and banners crowding and crushing each other in a confusion terrible to behold now suffering even more from their own chaos than from our lances jove brother trod brother down that day and comrade lay heaped on living comrade under that red confusion the pennons such as had outlived the storm so far were all entangled sheaves and sank whole stocks at once into the floundering sea below and kings and princes hinds and yeomen gasped and choked and glowered at us so fast locked in the deadly wedge that went slowly roaring back before our fiery onsets they could not move an arm or foot the tale is nearly told everywhere the english were victorious and the frenchmen fell in wild dismay before them many a bold attempt they made to turn the tide and many a desperate sally and gallant stand the fading daylight witnessed the old king of bohemia to whom daylight and night were all as one with fifty knights their reins knotted fast together charged us and died one and all like the good soldiers that they were and philip over yonder wrung his white hands and pawned his revenue in vows to the unmoved saints and the soft braggart peers that crowded round him gnawed their lips and frowned and looked first at the ruined smouldering fight then back far back to where in the south friendly evening was already holding out to them the dusky cover of the coming night it was a good day indeed and may england at her need ever fight so well would that i might in this truthful chronicle have turned to other things while the long roar of exultation goes up from famous crecy and the strong wine of well-deserved victory filled my heart alas there is that to tell which mars the tale and dims the shine of conquest already thirty thousand frenchmen were slain and the long swathes lay all across the swelling ground 
like the black rims of weed when the sea goes back only here and there the battle still went on where groups and knots of men were fighting and i with my good comrade flamaucoeur now at sunset was in such a melee on the right all through the day he had been like a shadow to me and shame that i have said so little of it where i went there he was flitting in his close grey armour close behind me quick watchful faithful all through the turmoil and dusty war mist escaping heaven knows how a thousand dangers riding his light war-horse down the bloody lanes of war as he ever rode it as if they too were one gentle retiring more expert in parrying thrust and blow than in giving that dear friend of mine with a heart made stout by consuming love against all its native fears had followed me and now the spent battle went smouldering out and we there thought was all extinguished when all on a sudden i tell it less briefly than it happened a desperate band of foemen bore down on us and as we joined my charger took a hurt and went crashing over and threw me full into the rank tangle of the under fight thereon the yeomen seeing me fall set up a cry and with a rush bore the frenchman four spear lengths back and lifted me unhurt from the littered ground they gave me a sword and as i turned from the foemen's ranks waving a beamy sword plumed by a towering crest of nodding feathers and covered by a mighty shield a gigantic warrior stepped out hoth i can see him now mad with defeat and shame striding on foot towards us a giant in glittering pearly armour that shone and glittered in the last rays of the level sun against the black backing of the evening sky as though its wearer had been the archangel gabriel himself it did not need to look upon him twice twas the lord high constable of france himself the best swordsman the sternest soldier and the brightest star of chivalry in the whole french firmament and if that noble peer was hot for fight no less was i stung by my fall and glorying in such a foeman i ran to meet him and there in a little open space while our soldiers leant idly on their weapons and watched we fought the first swoop of the great constable's humming falchion lit slanting on my shield and shore my crest then i let out and the blow fell on his shield and sent the giant staggering back and chipped the pretty quarterings of a hundred ancestors from that gilded target at it again we went and round and round raining our thunderous blows upon each other with noise like boulders crashing down a mountain valley i did not think there was a man within the four seas who could have stood against me so long as that fierce and bulky frenchman did for a long time we fought so hard and stubborn that the blood miry soil was stamped into a circle where we went round and round raining our blows so strong so quick and heavy that the air was full of tumult and glaring at each other over our morian bars while our burnished scales and links flew from us at every deadly contact and the hot breath steamed into the air and the warm smarting blood crept from between our jointed harness yet neither would bait a jot but with fiery hearts and heaving breasts and pain bursting muscles kept to it and stamped round and round those grimy steaming lists redoubtable indomitable and mad with the lust of killing and then jove how near spent i was the great constable on a sudden threw away his many-quartered shield and whirling up his sword with both hands high above his head aimed a frightful blow at me no mortal blade or shield or helmet could have withstood that mighty stroke i did not try but as it fell stepped nimbly back twas a good saxon trick learnt in the distant time and then as the falchion point buried itself a foot deep in the ground and the giant staggered forward i flew at him like a wildcat and through the close helmet bars through teeth and skull and the threefold solid brass behind thrust my sword so straight and fiercely the smoking point came two feet out beyond his nape and with a lurch and cry the great peer tottered and fell dead before me 
Now comes that thing to which all other things are little, the fellest gleam of angry steel of all the steel that had shone since noon, the cruelest stab of ten thousand stabs, the bitterest cry of any that had marred the full yellow circle of that August day. I had dropped on one knee by the champion, and, taking his hand, had loosed his visor, and shouted to two monks, who were pattering with bare feet about the field. For indeed I was sorry, if perchance any spark of life remained, so brave a knight should die unshriven to his contentment. And thus was forgotten for the moment the fight, the confronting rows of foemen, and how near I was to those who had seen their great captain fall by my hands. Miserable accursed oversight! I had not knelt by my fallen enemy a moment when suddenly my men set up a cry behind me. There was a rush of hoofs, and ere I could regain my feet or snatch my sword or shield, a great black French rider, like a shadowy fury, dropped from the sullen evening sky, his plumes all streaming behind him, his head low down between his horse's ears, and his long blue spear in rest, was thundering in mid-career against me, not a dozen paces distant. As I am a soldier, and have lived many ages by my sword, that charge must have been fatal, and would that it had been. How can I write it? Even as I started to my feet, before I could lift a brand or offer one light parry to that swift keen point, the horseman was upon me, and as he closed, as that great vengeance-driven tower of steel and flesh loomed above me, there was a scream, a wild scream of fear and love, and I clapped my hands to my ears now, centuries afterwards, to deaden the undying vibrations of that sound. And Flamaucoeur had thrown himself between me and the spear-point, had taken it, fenceless, unwarded, full in his side, and I saw the cruel shaft break short off by his mail, as those four, both horses and both riders, went headlong to the ground. Up rose the English with an angry shout, and swept past us, killing the black champion as they went, and driving the French before them far down into the valley. Then ran I to my dear comrade, and knelt and lifted him against my knee. He had swooned, and I groaned in bitterness and fear when I saw the strong red tide that was pulsing from his wound and quilting his bright English armour. With quick, nervous fingers, bursting such rivets as would not yield, all forgetful of his secret, and that I had never seen him on helm before, I unloosed his cask, and then gently drew it from his head. With a cry I dropped the great helm, and well nigh let e'en my fair burden fall, for there, against my knee, her white sweet face against my iron bosom, her fair yellow hair that had been coiled in the emptiness of her helmet, all adrift about us, those dear curled lips that had smiled so tender and indulgent on me, her gentle life ebbing from her at every throw, was not Flamaucoeur, the unknown knight, the foolish and lovesick boy, but that wayward, luckless girl, Isabel of Oswaldston herself. And if I had been sorry for my companion in arms, think how the pent grief and surprise filled my heart, as there, dying gently in my arms, was the fair girl, whom, by a tardy late-born love, new sprung in my empty heart, I had come to look upon as the point of my lonely world, my fair heritage in an empty epoch, for the asking. Soon she moved a little and sighed and looked up straight into my eyes. As she did so, the colour burnt for a moment with a pale glow in her cheeks, and I felt the tremor of her body as she knew her secret was a secret no longer. She lay there bleeding and gasping painfully upon my breast, and then she smiled and pulled my plumed head down to her and whispered, "'You are not angry?' "'Angry? Gods! My heart was heavier than it had been all that day of dint and carnage, and my eyes were dim and my lips were dry with the knowledge of the coming grief as I bent and kissed her. She took the kiss unresisting, as though it were her right, and gasped again. And you understand now, all, everything, why I ransomed the French maiden, why I would not write for thee to thy unknown mistress. I know, 
i know sweet girl and you bear no ill thought of me the great heaven you believe in be my witness sweet isabel i love you and know of nothing else she lay back upon me seeming to sleep for a moment or two then started up and clapped her hands to her ears as if to shut out the sound of bygone battle that no doubt was still thundering through them then swooned again while i bent in sorrow over her and tried in vain to soothe and staunch the great wound that was draining out her gentle life she lay so still and white that i thought she were already dead but presently with a gasp her eyes opened and she looked wistfully to where the western sky was hanging pale over the narrow english sea how far to england dear friend a few leagues of land and water sweet maid could i reach it dost thou think but then on an instant shaking her head she went on nay do not answer i was foolish to ask oh dearest dearest sister alianora my father my gentlest father oh tell them sir from me and beg them to forgive and she lay back white upon my shoulder she lay breathing slow upon me for a spell and then on a sudden her fair fingers tightened in my mailed hand and she signed that she would speak again remember that i love thee whispered isabel and with those last words the yellow head fell back upon my shoulder the blue eyes wavered and sank and her spirit fled back by the lines of gleeful shouting troops back by where the laughing english knights with visors up were talking of the day's achievements back by where the proud king hand in hand with his brave boy was thanking the stout english yeoman for crecy and another kingdom back by where the champing foamy chargers were picketed in rows back by the knots of archers all like honest workmen wiping down their unstrung bows back by groups of sullen prisoners and gaudy heaps of captured pennons we passed in front four good yeomen bore isabel upon their trestled spears then came i bareheaded i kinsmanless to her in all that camp the only kin and then our drooping chargers empty saddled led by young squires behind and seeming good beasts to sniff and scent the sorrow of that fair burden on ahead so we went through the victorious camp to our lodgment and there they placed isabel on her bare soldier couch her feet to the door of her soldier tent and left us end of chapter fifteen Chapter Sixteen of the Wonderful Adventures of Fra the Phoenician by Edwin Lester Arnold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Unwashed, unfed, my dinted armour on me still, battle stained and rent, unhelmeted, ungloved, my sword and scabbard cast by my hollow shield in a dark corner of the tent, I watched tearless and stern all that night by the bier of the pale white girl who had given so much for me and taken so poor a reward i who so fanciful and wayward had thought i might safely toy with the sweet tender of her affection sprung how or why i knew not and take or leave it as seemed best to my convenience brooded all the long black watch over that gentle broken vessel that lay there white and still before me alike indifferent to gifts or giving and now and then i would start up from the stool i had drawn near to her and pace with bent head and folded arms the narrow space remembering how warm the rising tide of love had been flowing in my heart for that fair dead thing so short a time before so short a time before why it was but yesterday that she wrote for me that missive to herself and i fool and blind could not read the light that shone behind those grey visor bars as she penned the lines or translate the tremor that shook that sweet scribe's fingers or recognise the heave of the maiden bosom under its steel and silk i groaned in shame and grief and bent over her thinking how dear things might have been had they been otherwise 
and loving her no whit the less because she was so cold immovable saying i knew not what into her listless ear and nourishing in loneliness and solitude all those long hours the black flower of the love that was a light too late in my heart i would not eat or rest though my dinted armour was heavy as lead upon my spent and weary limbs though the leather jerkin under that was stiff with blood and sweat and opened my bleeding wounds each time i moved i would not be eased of one single smart i thought let the cursed seams and gashes sting and bite and my hot flesh burn beneath them mayhap twould ease the bitter anger of my mind and i repulsed all those who came with kind or curious eyes to the tent door and would not hear of ease or consolation even the king came down and in respect to that which was within dismounted and stood like a simple knight without asking if he might see me but i would not share my sorrow with any one and sent the page who brought me word that the king was standing in the porch to tell him so and accomplished in courtesy as in war the victorious monarch bent his head and mounted and rode silently back to his own lodging the gay gallants who had known me came on the whisper of the camp one by one though all were hungry and weary and lifted the flap a little and said something such as they could think of and peered at me grimly repellent in the shadows and peeped curiously at that fair white soldier lain on the trestles in her knightly gear so straight and trim and went away without daring to approach more nearly my veterans clipped their jolly soldier songs though they had well deserved them and took their suppers silently by the flickering camp-fire once they sent him among them that i was known to like the best with food and wine and clean linen but i would not have it and the good soldier put them down on one side of the door and went back as gladly as he who retreats skin whole from the cave where a bear keeps watch and ward last of all there came the fall of quieter feet upon the ground and in place of the clank of soldier harness the rattle of the beads and rosaries and cross and looking out there was the king's own chaplain bareheaded and the three grey friars behind him i needed ghostly comfort just then as little as i needed temporal and at first i thought to repulse them surlily but reflecting that the maid had ever been devout and held such men as these in high esteem i suffered them to enter and stood back while they did by her the ceremonial of their office they made all smooth and fair about and lit candles at her feet and gave her a crucifix and sprinkled water and knelt throwing their great black shadows athwart the white shrine of my dear companion the while they told their beads and the chaplain prayed when they had done the priest rose and touched me on the arm son he said the king has given an earl's ransom to be expended in masses for thy lemon soul father i replied tender the king my thanks for what was well meant and as princely generous as becomes him but tell him all the prayers thy convent could count from now till the great ending would not bleach this white maid's soul an atom whiter earn your ransom if you will but not here leave me to my sorrow i will give your answer soldier but these holy brothers the king wished it must stay and share your vigil until the morning it is their profession their prayerful presence can ward off the spirits of darkness weariness never sits on their eyes as it sits now on thine let them stay with thee it is only fit not for another ransom priest i will not brook their confederate tears i will not wing this fair girl's soul with their hireling prayers out good fellows my mood is wondrous short and i would not willing do that which to-morrow i might repent of but brother said one monk gently hence hence i have no brothers go can you look on me here in this extremity can you see my hacked and bleeding harness and the shine of bitter grief in my eyes and stand pattering there of prayers and sympathy out out or by every lying relic in thy cloisters i add some other saints to thy chapter rolls they went and as the tent flap dropped behind them and the sound of their sandalled feet died softly away into the gathering night i turned sorrowful and sad to my watch i drew a stool to the maiden bier and sat and took her hand so white and smooth and cold and looked at the fair young face that death had made so passionless that sweet mirror upon which the last time we had been together in happiness 
the rosy light of love was shining and sweet presumption and maiden shame were striving and as i looked and held her hand the dim tent walls fell away and the painted lists rose up before me and the littered flowers my quick curveting charger stamped into the earth and the blare of the herald's trumpets the flutter of the ribbons and the gay tires of brave lords and fair ladies all centred around the dais where those two fair sisters sat gods was that long sigh the night wind circling about my tent flap or in truth the sigh of slighted isabel as i rode past her chair with the victor's circlet on my spear point and laid it at the footstool of her sister i bent over that fair white corpse so sick in mind and body that all the real was unreal and all the unreal true i saw the painted pageantry of her father's hall again and the coloured reflections of the blazoned windows on the polished corridors shine upon our dim and sandy floor and down the long vistas of my aching memory the groups of men and women moved in a motley harmony of colour a fair shifting mosaic of pattern and hue and light that radiated and came back ever to those two fair english girls i heard the rippling laughter on courtly lips the whispered jest of gallants and the thoughtless glee of damsels i heard the hum and smooth praise that circled round the black elder sister's chair and at my elbow the father saying my daughter my daughter isabel and started up to find myself alone and that sweet horrid thing there in the low flickering taper light unmoved unmovable i sat again and presently the wavering shadows spread out into the likeness of great cedar branches casting their dusky shelter over the soft sweet scented ground and as the hushed air swayed to and fro those great velvet screens isabel stepped from them all in white and ran to me and stopped and clapped her hands before her eyes and on her throbbing bosom then stretched those trembling fingers beseechingly to me fresh from that sweet companionship then down upon her knees and clipped me round with her fair white arms and turned back her head and looked upon me with wild wet yearning eyes and cheeks that burnt for love and shame i would not have it i laughed with the bitter mockingness of one possessed by another love and unwound those ivory bonds and pushed the fair maid back and there against the dusk of leaf and branch she stood and wrung her fingers and beat her breast and spoke so sweet and passionate that even my icy mood half thawed under the white light of her reckless love and i let her take my hand and hold and rain hot kisses on it and warm pattering tears till all the strength was running from me and i half turned and my fingers closed on hers but gods how cold they were and with a stifled cry i woke again in the little tent to find my hand fast locked in the icy fingers of the dead it was a long weary night and sad as was my watch and hectic as the visions which swept through my heavy head i would not quicken by one willing hour of sleep the sad duties of that grey to-morrow which i knew must come at times i sat and stared into the yellow tapers living the brief spell of my last life again all the episode and change all the hurry and glitter and unrest that was for ever my portion and then in spite of resolution i would doze to other visions outlined more brightly on the black background of oblivion and then i started up my will all at war with tired nature's sweet insistence and paced in weary round our canvas cell solitary but for those teeming thoughts and my own black shadow which stalked sullen and slow ever beside me but who can deride the great mother for long twas sleep i needed and she would have it and so it came presently upon my heavy eyelids strong deep sleep as black and silent as the abyss of the nether world my head sank upon my arm my arm upon the foot of the velvet bier and there in my mail under the thin taper light worn out with battle and grief i slept i know not how long it was some hours most likely but after a time the strangest feeling took possession of me in that slumber and a fine ethereal terror purged of gross material fear possessed my spirit i awoke not with the pleasant drowsiness which marks refreshment 
but wide and staring and my black phrygian hair without the cause of sight or sound stood stiff upon my head for something was moving in the silent tent i glared around yet nothing could be seen the lights were low in their sockets but all else was in order my piled shield and helmets lay there in the shadows our warlike implements and gear were all as i had seen them last no noise or vision broke the blank and yet a coward chill sat on me for here and there was moving something unseen unheard unfelt by outer senses i rose and fearful and yet angry to be cowed by a dreadful nothing stared into every corner and shadow but naught was there then i lifted a dim taper and held it over the face of the dead girl and stared amazed were it given to mortals to die twice that girl had but a short time before and her sweet face had worn the reflection of that dreadful day there was a pallid fright and pain upon it we could not smooth away and now some wonderful strange thing had surely happened and all the unrest was gone all the pain dissatisfaction and frightened wonder the maid was still and smooth and happy-looking hoth as i bent over her she looked just as one might look who reads aright some long enigma and finds relief with a sigh from some hard problem she slept so wondrous still and quiet and looked so marvellous fair now and contented that it purged my fear and strong in that fair presence how could i be else i sat and after a time though you may wonder at it i slept again i dozed and dozed and dozed in happy forgetfulness of the present while the black night wore on to morning and the last faint flushes of the priestly tapers played softly in their sockets and then again i started up with every nerve within me thrilling my clenched fists on my knees and my wide eyes glaring into the mid-gloom for that strange nothing was moving gently once more about us fanning me it seemed with the rhythmed swing of unseen draperies circling in soft cadenced circles here and there mute voiceless presenceless and yet so real and tangible to some unknown inner sense that hailed it from within me that i could almost say that now twas here and now twas there and locate it with trembling finger although in truth nothing moved or stirred i looked at the maid she was as she had been then into every dusky place and corner but nothing showed then rose and walked to the tent flap and lifted it and looked out down in the long valley below the sombre shadows were seamed by the winding of the pale river and all away on the low meadows piled thick and deep with the black mounds of dead foemen the pale marsh lights were playing amid the corpses leaping in ghostly fantasy from rank to rank and heap to heap coalescing separating shining vanishing all in the unbroken twilight silence and those sombre fields below were tapestried with the thin wisps of white mist that lay in the hollows and were shredded out into weird shapes and forms over the black bosom of the near-spent night up above far away in the east where the low hills lay flat in the distance the lapid fringe of the purple sky was dipped in the pale saffron of the coming sun and overhead a few white stars were shining and now and then the swart almost unseen wings of a raven went gently beating through the starlit void and as i watched i saw him and his brothers check over the cressy ridges and with hungry croak like black spirits circle round and drop one after another through the thin white veils of vapour that shrouded prince chiefs and vassals peer and peasant in those deep long swathes of the black harvest we cut but left ungarnered yesterday near around me the english camp was all asleep tired and heavy with the bygone battle the listless pickets on the misty distant mounds hung drooping over their piled spears the metal chargers heads were all asag they were so weary as they stood among the shadows by their untouched fodder and the damp pennons and bannerets over the nightly porches scarce lifted on the morning air that air came cool and sad yonder from the english sea and wandered melancholy down our lifeless empty canvas streets lifting the loose tent flaps and sighing as it strayed among the sleeping groups 
stirring with its unseen feet the white ashes of the dead campfires the only moving presence in all the place sad silent and listless i dropped the hangings over the chill morning glimmer the camp of sleeping warriors and dusky valley of the dead and turned again to my post i was not sleepy now nor afraid even though as i entered a draught of misty outer air entered with me and the last atom of the priestly taper shone fitful and yellow for a moment upon the dead isabel and then went out i sat down by the maid in the chill dark and looked sadly on the ground the while my spirits were as low as you may well guess and the wind went moaning round and round the tent but i had not sat a moment scarcely twenty breathing spaces when a faint fine scent of herb cured wolfskins came upon the air and strange shadows began to stand out clear upon the floor i saw my weapon shining with a pale refulgence and by all the gods the walls of the tent were a shimmer with pale lustre with a half stifled cry i leapt to my feet and there there across the bier though you tell me i lie a thousand times there calm refulgent looking gently in the dead girl's face splendid in her ruddy savage beauty bending over that white marbled body so ghostly thin and yet so real so true in every line and limb was blodwyn blodwyn the british chieftainess my thousand years dead wife standing there serene and lovely with that strange lavender glow about her was that wonderful and dreadful shade holding the dead girl's hand and looking at her closely with a face that spoke of neither resentment nor sorrow i stood and stared at them every wit within me numb and cold by the suddenness of it and then the apparition slowly lifted her eyes to mine and i the wildest sensations of the strong old love and brand new fear possessed me what do you tell me that affection dies why there in that shadow tent so long after so untimely so strange and useless all the old stream of the love i had borne for that beautiful slave girl though it had been cold and overlaid by other loves for a thousand years welled up in my heart on a sudden i made half a pace towards her i stretched a trembling entreating hand yet drew it back for i was mortal and i feared and an ecstasy of pleasure filled my throbbing veins and my love said on she was thine once and must be now down to thy knees and claim her what matters anything if thou hast a lien upon such a splendid loveliness and my coward flesh hung back cold and would not and now back and now forward i swayed with these contending feelings while that fair shadow eyed me with the most impenetrable calm at last she spoke with never a tone in her voice to show she remembered it was near three hundred years since she had spoken before my phoenician she said in a soft monotone looking at the dead isabel who lay pale in the soft blue shine about her this was a pity you are more dull-witted than i thought i bent my head but could not speak and so she asked didst really never guess who it was yonder steel armour hid not once i said oh sweetly dreadful nor who it was that stirred the white maid to love over there in her home what i gasped was that you was that your face then in truth i saw reflecting in this dead girl's when first i met her why yes good merchant and how you could not know it passes all comprehension and then it was you dear and dreadful who moved her jove twas you who filled her beating pulses there down by the cedars it was you who prompted her hot tongue to that passionate wooing but why why that shadow looked away for a moment and then turned upon me one fierce fleeting glance of such strange concentrated unquenchable impatient love that it numbed my tongue and stupefied my senses and i staggered back scarce knowing whether i were answered or were not presently she went on then again you are a little forgetful at times my master so full of your petty loves and wars it vexes me vexes you that were wonderful indeed yet tis more wonderful that you submit one word to me to come but one moment and stand shining there as now you do and i should be at your feet strange incomparable 
it might be so but that were supposing such moments as these were always possible dost not notice phoenician how seldom i have been to thee like this and yet remembering that i forget thee not that mayhap i love thee still canst thou doubt but that wayward circumstance fits to my constant wish but seldom yet you are immortal time and space seem nothing barriers and distance all those things that shackle men have no meaning for you all thy being formed on the structure of a wish and every earthly law subservient to your fancy how is it that you can do so much and yet so little and be at once so dominant and yet so feeble i told you dear friend before that with new capacities new laws arise i ne'er forget how far i once could see what was the edge of that shallow world you live in where exactly the confines of your powers and liberty are set but this i know for certain that while with us the possible widens out into splendid vagueness the impossible still exists and do you really mean then that fate is still the stronger among you this fair girl here sweet shadow oh with one of those terrible and shining arms crossed there on thy bosom couldst thou not have guided into happy void that fatal spear that killed surely surely it were so easy the priestess dropped her fair head and over her dim white shoulders and her pleasant scented hazy wolfskins her ruddy hair all agleam in that strange refulgence shone like a cascade of sleeping fire then she looked up and replied in low tones the swimmer swims and the river runs the wished-for point may be reached or it may not the river is the stronger somehow i felt that my shadowy guest was less pleased than before so i thought a moment and then said where is she now and glanced at isabel the novice smiled blodwyn is asleep oh wake her i cried for one moment for half a breath for one moiety of a pulse and i will never ask the other questions insatiable incredulous how far will thy reckless love and wonder go must i lay out before thy common eyes all the things of the unknown for you to sample as you did your bags of fig and olive i loved her before and i love her still even as i loved and still love thee does she know this she knows as much as you know little look and the shadow spread out one violet hand over that silent face i looked and then leapt back with a cry of fear and surprise the dead girl was truly dead not a muscle or a finger moved yet at that bidding i turned my eyes upon her there under the tender glowing shadow of that wondrous palm a faint sweet flush of colourless light rose up within her face and on it i read for one fleeting moment such inexplicable knowledge such extraordinary felicity such impenetrable contentment that i stood spellbound all of a tremble while that wondrous radiance died away even quicker than it had risen gods twas like the shine of the herald dawn on a summer morning it was like the flush on the water of a coming sunrise i drew my hand across my face and looked up expecting the chieftainess would have gone but she was still there are you satisfied for the moment dear trader or would you catechise me as you did just now yonder by the fire under the altar in the circle just now i exclaimed as her words swept back to me the remembrance of the stormy night in the old saxon days when with the fair editha asleep at my knee that shade had appeared before just now why shadow that was three hundred years ago three hundred what three hundred years full round circles three hundred varying seasons why blodwyn forests have been seeded and grown venerable and decayed about those stones since we were there well maybe they have i now remember that interval you call a year and what strange store we set by it and i dimly recollect said the dreamy spirit what wide asunder episodes those were between the green flush of your forests and the yellow but now why the grains of sand here on thy tent floor are not set more close together do not seem more one simple whole to you than your trivial seasons do to me ah dear merchant and as you smile to see the ripples of the sea sparkle a moment in frolic chase of one another and then be gone into the void from whence they came so do we lie and watch thy petty years shine for a moment on the smooth bosom of the immense 
deep strange and weird seemed her words to me that night and much she said more than i have told i could not understand but sat with bent head and crossed arms full of strange perplexity of feeling now glancing at the dead soldier-maid my body loved and then looking at that comely column of blue woman vapour that sat so placid on the foot of the bier and spoke so simply of such wondrous things for an hour we talked and then on a sudden blodwyn started to her feet and stood in listening attitude they are coming phoenician she cried and pointed to the door i arose with a strange uneasy feeling and looked out the grey dawn had spread from sky to sky and an angry flush was over all the air the morning wind blew cold and melancholy and the shrouded mists like bands of pale spectres were trooping up the bloody valley before it but otherwise not a soul was moving not a sound broke the ghostly stillness i dropped the awning and shook my head at the fair priestess whereon she smiled superior as one might at a wayward child and for a minute or two we spoke again together then up she got once more tall and stately with dilated nostrils and the old proud expectant look i had seen on her sweet red face so often as we together hand in hand and heart to heart had galloped out to tribal war they come phoenician and i must go she whispered and again she pointed to the tent door though never a sound or footfall broke the stillness you shall not must not go wife priestess queen i cried throwing myself on my knee at those shadowy feet and extending my longing arms oh you that can awake put me to sleep you that can read to the finish of every half-told tale relieve me of the long record of my life oh stay and mend my loneliness or if you go let me come too i ask not how or whither not yet she said not yet and then while more seemed actually upon her lips i did hear the sound of footfalls outside and wondering i sprang to the curtain and lifted it there outside standing in the first glint of the yellow sunshine were some half-dozen of my honest veterans all with spades and picks and in their leathern doublets you see sir said the spokesman sorrowfully the while he scraped the half-dry clay from his trenching spade we have come round for our brave young captain for your good lady sir the first presently we shall be very busy and we thought mayhap you would like this over as soon and as quiet as might be they had come for isabel i turned back into the tent wondering what they would think of my strange guest and she was gone not one ray of light was left behind not one thread of her lavender skirt shone against my black walls only the cold pale girl there stiff and white with the shine of the dawn upon her dead face and all my long pain and vigils told upon me and with a cry of pain and grief i could not master i dropped upon a seat and hid my face upon my arm i had had enough of france with that night and three hours afterwards went straight to the king and told him so begging him to relieve me from my duty and let me get back to england there to seek the dead maid's kindred and find in some new direction forgetfulness of everything about the victorious camp and to this the king replied by commending my poor service far too highly saying some fair kind things out of his smooth courtier tongue about her that was no more and in good part upbraiding me for bringing as he supposed i had brought one so gentle nurtured so far afield then he said in faith good soldier were to-day but yesterday and philip's array still before us we would not spare you even though our sympathy were yours as fully as tis now but my misguided cousin is away to paris and his following are scattered to the four winds for which god and all the saints be thanked there is thus less need for thy strong arm and brave presence in our camp and if you really would why then go and may kind time heal those wounds which believe me i do most thoroughly assess i bent and kissed the kindly monarch's hand and made my thanks then turned but stay a minute he cried after me how soon could you make a start i have no gear i said and all my prisoners have been set free unransomed i could start here even as i stand 
soldierly answered exclaimed the king a good knight should have no baggage but his weapons and no attachments but his duty now look i can both relieve you of irksome charges here and excuse with reason both ample and honourable your going come to me as soon as you have put by your armour i will have ready for you a scrip sealed and signed no messenger has yet gone over to england with the news of our glorious yesterday and this charge shall be thine take the scrip straight to the queen in england there no thanks away away thou wilt be the most popular man in all my realm before the sun goes down i fear i well knew how honourable was this business that the good king had planned for me and made my utmost dispatch i gave my tent to one esquire and my spare armour to another i ran and gripped the many bronzed hands of my tough companions and told them alas unwittingly what a lie that were that i would come again then i bestowed my charger jove how reluctant was the gift upon the next in rank below me and mounted isabel's light war-horse and paid my debts and settled all accounts and was back at our great captain's tent just as his chaplain was sanding the last lines upon that dispatch which was to startle yonder fair country waiting so expectant across the narrow sea they rolled it up in silk and leather and put it in a metal cylinder and shut the lid and sealed it with the king's own seal and then he gave it to me take this he said straight to the queen and give it into her own hands be close and silent for you will know it were not meet to be robbed of thy news upon the road but i need not tell you of what becomes a trusty messenger there so strap it in thy girdle and god speed thee surely such big news was never packed so small before i left the royal tent and vaulted into the ready saddle without one hour i thought as the swift steed's head was turned to the westward may take me to the shore and two others may set me on foot in england then if they have relays upon the road three more will see me kneeling at the lady's feet the while her fingers burst these seals lord how they shall shout this afternoon how the prentices shall toss their caps and the fat burghers crowd the narrow streets and every rustic hamlet green ring to the sky with gratitude ah six hours i thought might do the journey but read and you shall see how long it took scouring over the low grassy plains as hard as the good horse could gallop with the grey sea broadening out ahead with every mile we went full of thoughts of a busy past and uncertain future i hardly noticed how the wind was freshening yet when we rode down at last by a loose hill road to the beach strong gusts were piping amid the tree-tops and the king's galleys were lurching and rolling together at their anchors by the landing stage as the short waves came crowding in one close upon another under the first pressure of a coming storm but wind or no wind i would cross and i spoke to the captain of the galleys showing him my pass with its royal signet and saying that i must have a ship at once though all the cave of eblis were let loose upon us that worthy weather-beaten fellow held the mandate most respectfully in one hand while he pulled his grizzled beard with the other and stared out into the north where under a black canopy of lowering sky the sea was seamed with grey and hurrying squalls then turned to the cluster of sailors who were crowded round us guessing my imperious errand to know who would start upon it and those rough salts swore no man of sanity would venture out not even for a king's generous bounty not even to please victorious edward would they go no nor to ease the expectant hearts of twenty thousand wives or glad the proud eyes of ten score hundred mothers it was impossible they said see how the frothy spray was flying already over the harbour bar and how shrill the frightened sea-mews were rising above the land no ship would hold together in such a wind as that brewing out over there no man this side of hell could face it and yet why laughed a leathery fellow slapping his mighty fist into his other palm as i was born by sarum and knew the taste of salt spray near as early as i knew my mother's milk it shall never be said i was frightened by a hollow sky and a frenchman's wind i'll be your pilot sir and i will go wherever old harry dares put in a stout young fellow and i and i 
and i was chorused on every side as the brave english seaman caught the bold infection and in a brief space there under the lee of the grey harbour jetty before a motley cheering crowd all in the blustering wind and rain i rode my palfrey up into the sloping way and on to the impatient tossing little bark that was to bear the great news to england we stabled the good steed safe under the half-deck forward set the mizzen and cast off the hawser and soon the little vessel's prow was bursting through the crisp waves at the harbour mouth her head for home and behind dim through the rainy gusts the white house fronts of the beach village and far away the uplands where the english army lay we reefed and set the sails as we drew from the land but truly these fellows were right when they hung back from sharing the peril and the glory with me the strong blue waters of the midland sea whereon i had first sailed my merchant bark were like the ripples of a sheltered pond to the roaring trench and furrows of this narrow northern strait all day long we fought to westward and every hour we spent the wind came stronger and more keenly out of the black funnel of the north and the waves swelled broader and more monstrous by noon we saw the english shore gleam ghostly white through the flying reek in front but by then so fierce was the north-easter howling that though we went to windward and off again doing all that good seamen could now stealing a spell ahead and anon losing it amid a blinding squall we could not near the english port for which we aimed there in the cleft of the dim white cliffs after a long time of this our captain came to me where i leant watchful against the mast and said the king has made an order as you will know all vessels from france are to sail for his town of dover there and nowhere else on pain of a fine that would go near to swamp such as we good skipper i answered i know the law but there are exceptions to every rule which well taken only cast the more honour on general stringency king edward would have you make that port at all reasonable times but if you cannot reach it as you surely cannot now you are not bound to sail me his messenger to paradise in lieu thereof i pray you put down your helm and run and take the nearest harbour the wind will let us at this the captain turned upon his heel well pleased and our ship came round and now before the gale sailed perhaps a little easier but it scarcely bettered our fortune a short time before dusk while we wallowed heavily in the long furrows my poor palfrey was thrown and broke her forelegs over her trestle bar and between fear and pain screamed so loud and shrill it chilled even my stalwart sailors then later on as we rode the frothy summit of a giant wave our topmast snapped and fell among us and the wild loose ropes writhed and lashed about worse than a hundred biting serpents and the bellowing sail like a great bull jerked and strained for a moment so that i thought it would unstep the mast itself and then went all to tatters with a hollow boom while we knee-deep in the swirling sea that filled our hollow deckless ship gentle and simple prentice and knight whipped out our knives and gave over to the hungry ocean all that riven tackle it was enough to make the stoutest heart beat low to ride in such a creaking retching cockle-shell over the hill and dale of that stupendous water now out of the tumble and hiss down we would go careering down the glassy side of a mighty green slope the creamy white water boiling under our low-sunk bows and there in mid-hollow with the tempest howling overhead we would have for breathing space a blessed spell of seeming calm and then ere we could taste that scant felicity the reeling floor would swell beneath us and out of the watery glen hurtled by some unseen power we rose again up up to the spume and spray to the wild shouting wind that thrilled our humming cordage and lay heavy upon us while the gleaming turmoil through which we staggered and rushed leapt at our fleeting sides like packs of white sea-wolves and all the heaving leaden distance of the storm lay spread in turn before us then down again hour after hour we reeled down the english coast with the wild mid-channel in fury on our left and the dim seen ramparts of breakers at the cliff feet on our right then as we went the light began to fail us our weather-beaten steersman's face 
which had looked from his place by the tiller so calm and steadfast over the war of wind and sea became troubled and long and anxiously he scanned the endless line of surf that shut us from the many little villages and creeks we were passing you see sir knight shouted the captain to me as wet through we held fast to the same rope tis a question with us whether we find a shelter before the light goes down or whether we spend a night like this out on the big waters yonder and does he i asked who pilots us know of a near harbour ah there is one somewhere hereabout but with a perilous bar across the mouth and the tide serves but poorly for getting over if we can cross it there is a dry jacket and supper for all this evening and if we do not may the saints in paradise have mercy on us try good fellow try i shouted many a dangerous thing comes easier by the venturing and i am already a laggard post so the word was passed for each man to stand by his place and through the gloom and storm the beating spray and the wild pelting rain just as the wet evening fell we neared the land we swept in from the storm and soon there was the bar plain enough a shining thunderous crescent glimmering pallid under the shadow of the land a frantic hell of foam and breakers that heaved and broke and surged with an infernal storm deriding tumult and tossed the fierce white fountains of its rage massed high into the air and swirled and shone and crashed into the gloom sending the white litter of its turmoil in broad ghostly sheets far into that black still water we could make out beyond under the veil of spume and foam hanging above that boiling cauldron straight to it we went through the cold fierce wind with the howl of the black night behind us and the thunder of that shine before we came to the bar and i saw the white light on the strained brave faces of my silent friends i looked aft and there was the helmsman calm and strong unflinchingly eyeing the infernal belt before us i saw all this in a scanty second and then the white hell was under our bows and towering high above our stern a mighty crested foam-seamed breaker with the speed of a javelin thrown by a strong hand we rushed into the rack one blinding moment of fury and turmoil and then i felt the vessel stagger as she touched the sand the next instant her sides went all to splinters under my very feet and the great wave burst over us and rushed thundering on in conscious strength and not two planks of that ill-fated ship it seemed were still together over and over through the swirl and hum i was swept the dying cries of my shipfares sounding in my ears like the wail of disembodied spirits now for a moment i was high in the spume and ruck gasping and striking out as even he who likes his life the least will gasp in like case and then with thunderous power the big wave hurled me down into the depth down down into the inky darkness with all the noises of inferno in my ears and the great churning waters pressing on me till the honest air seemed leagues above and my strained bursting chest was dying for a gasp then again the hideous playful waters would tear asunder and toss me high into the keen strong air with the yellow stars dancing above and the long line of the black coast before my salt tear-filled eyes and propped me up just so long as i might get half a gasping sigh and hear the storm beating wildly on the farther side of the bar then the mocking sea would laugh in savage frolic and down again gods right into the abyss of the nether turmoil fathoms deep like a strand of worthless sea-rack scouring over the yellow sand-beds where never living man went before all in the cruel fingers of the icy midnight sea was i tossed here and there and when i did not die when the savage sea like a great beast of prey let me live by gasps to spread its enjoyments the more and tossed and teased me and shouted so hideous in my ears and weighed me down why the last spark of spirit in me burnt up on a sudden fierce and angry i set my teeth and struck out hard and strong ah and the sea grew somewhat sleek when i grew resolute and after some minutes of this new struggle rolled more gently and buried me less deep each time in its black foam-ribbed vortex 
and presently in half an hour perhaps the thunder of the bar was all behind me instead of round about the stars were steadier in their places the dim barrier of the land frowned through the rain direct above and a few minutes more wondrous spent and weary the black water flowing in at my low and swollen lips with every stroke yet strong in my heart and hopeful i found myself floating up a narrow estuary on a dim foam-flecked but peaceful tide the strong but gentle current swept in with the flowing water under the dark shadows of the land past what seemed in the wet night gloom like rugged banks of tree and forest and finally floated me to where among loose boulders and sand the tamed water was lapping on a smooth and level beach i staggered ashore and sat down as wet and sorry as well could be life ran so cold and numb within it seemed scarce worth the cost spent in keeping my scrip was still at my side but my sword was gone and my clothing torn to ribbons and a more buffeted messenger never eyed askance the scroll that led him into such a plight where was i the great gods who live for ever alone could tell yet surely scores of miles from where i should be i got to my feet reeking with wet and spray the gusty wind tossing back the black phrygian locks from off my forehead and glared around sigh 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 went the gale in the pines above while mournful pipings came about the shore like wandering voices and the sea boomed sullenly out yonder in the darkness i stared and stared and then started back a pace and stared again i turned round on my heel and glowered up the narrow inlet and out to sea then at the beetling crags above and the dim seen bounds inland then all on a sudden burst into a scornful laugh a wild angry laugh that the rocks banded about on the wet night air and sent back to me blended with all the fitful sobs and moaning of the wind the lonely harbour that of a thousand harbours i had come to was the old british beach it was my druid priestess's village place that i was standing on i laughed long and loud as i the old trader in wine and olives i the felucca captain with cloth and wine below and a comely red-haired slave on deck i again in other guise royal edward's chosen messenger as good a knight as ever jerked a victorious brand home into its scabbard stood there with chattering teeth and shaking knee mocking fate and strange chance in a reckless spirit i laughed until my mood changed on a sudden and then swearing by twenty forgotten hierarchies i would not stand shivering in the rain for any wild pranks that fate might play me i staggered off on to the hard ground every trace of my old village had long since gone yet though it were a thousand years ago i knew my way about with a strange certainty i left the shore and pushed into the overhanging woods dark and damp and sombre and presently i even found a well-known track for these things never change and half glad and half afraid a strange tattered dismal prodigal come strangely home i pushed by dripping branch and shadowy coverts out into the open grass hills beyond here on some ghostly tumuli near about the grey shine of the night showed scattered piles of mighty stones and broken circles that once had been our temples and the burial places for great captains i turned my steps to one of these on the elbow of a little ridge overlooking the harbour and perhaps two hundred paces inland from it and found a vast lichened slab of stupendous bulk undermined by weather and all on a slope with a single entrance underneath one end did ever man ask lodgment in like circumstances it was the burial mound of an old druid headman and i laughed a little again to think how well i had known him grim old ufner of the reeking altars hoth what a cruel bloody old priest he was never did a man before i chuckled combine such piety and savagery together how that old fellow's cruel small eyes did sparkle with native pleasure as the thick pungent smoke of the sacrificial fire went roaring up 
and the hiss and splutter half drowned the screaming of men and women pent in their wicker cages amid that blaze oh old ufner liked the smell of hot new blood and there was no music to his british ear like the wail of a captive's anguish and then for me to be pattering round his cell like this in the gusty dark midnight shivering and alone patting and feeling the mighty lid of that great crypt and begging a friendly shelter in my stress and weariness of that ghostly hostelry it was surely strange indeed twice or thrice i walked round the great coffer it was near as big as a herdsman's cottage and then finding no other crack or cranny stopped and stooped before the tiny portal at the lower end i saw as i knelt that the tremendous slab was resting wondrous lightly on a single point of upright stone just like the trigger of an urchin's mouse-trap but nothing daunted pushing and squeezing in i crept and felt with my hands all that i could not see the foxes and the weather had long since sent all there was of ufner to dust all was bare and smooth while round the sides were solid deep earth-planted slabs of rock no one knew better than i how thick they were and heavy and on the floor a soft couch of withered leaves and grasses now one more sentence and the chapter is ended i had not coiled myself down on those leaves a minute my weary head had nodded but once upon my arm my eyelids drooped but twice when with a soundless start undermined by the fierce storm and moved a fatal hair's breadth by my passage the propping keystone fell in and all at once my giant roof began to slide that vast and ponderous stone that had taken two tribes to move was slipping slowly down and as it went all along where it ground a line of glowing lambent fire a smoking hissing band of dust marked its silent irresistible progress a hissing belt of dust and glow that shone for a half moment round the fringe of that stupendous portal and then too late as i tottered to my weary knees and extended a feeble hand towards the entrance that mighty door came to a rest that ponderous slab that scarce a thousand men could move fell with a hollow click three inches into the mortises of the earth-bound walls and there in that mighty coffer i was locked fast deep and safe i listened not a sound not a breath of the storm without moved in that strange chamber i stared about and not one cranny of light broke the smooth velvet darkness what mattered it i was weary and tired to-morrow i would shout and some one might hear to-night i would rest and jove how deep and warm and pleasant was that leafy bed that chance had spread there on the floor for me End of chapter 16